Immediately following my talk, I will read an excerpt from my epic poem, The Parliament of Poets, which Hayden is a character. <laughs> my title, Under a High Window of Angel Hall, an epigraph from John Milton's Elegy for Damon. It is hard for a man to know to find one kindred spirit among thousands of his fellows, and if at last, softened by our prayers, fate grants one, there comes the unexpected day, the unlooked for hour which snatches him away, leaving an eternal emptiness. As a young poet, I had chosen not to go off to the university after high school, but followed what I thought of as the solitary examples of Robert Frost and E.A. Robinson and other writers. For a few years, living and writing on an old farm in Oakland Township, Michigan, I tried on the singing robes of Whitman and others. Eventually, moving to Detroit, near Seven Mile and John R., having been born at Deaconess Hospital on East Jefferson Avenue. More than one line of my family tree has roots extending into the neighborhoods nearby. One day, at the Detroit Public Library, I noticed a placard that a librarian had posted about the poet Robert Hayden. I sought out his books, and read and immersed myself in his poetry, deciding in time I would transfer to the University of Michigan in hope of studying with him. My dream came true more than I had ever expected. Taking three classes with him, one in recent poetry, an independent study of Emily Dickinson, and a private tutorial in writing. As I explained in my essay on Hayden in my book, The Grove of the Humanities, during the poetry class, he was diagnosed with cancer and was understandably devastated by the prognosis. Looking back, I think my writing for him a paper on Conte Cullen brought me to his intention for an office visit before long in and out of his classes. It, his poetry had already worked its way deep into my consciousness. He knew I held him in high esteem, and I felt it a duty to let him know it. In time, he became not only older poet, master, mentor, but I believe, mutually heartfelt friend, father, taking me increasingly into his confidence, hiring me as a secretary to help him get his papers in order, somewhat, and allowing me entry into the private life of his home and family. Often two or three afternoons a week, for the last several months of his life. Robert Hayden is not merely a literary academic subject for me, but the pivotal personal relationship of my entire adult life. I found in Hayden's writing a confrontation and engagement with injustice and modernity unlike anything else on the landscape of post-World War II poetry. As a Detroiter myself, having been born in the city with many childhood memories, eventually growing up in the suburbs, I was fascinated by Hayden's attempt to evoke and probe the complex human experience of modern life. Whether writing about Detroit and America's seemingly endless traumas over race, the wider sweep around the globe, or the spiritual profundities he intimated. Robert Hayden's poetry has always spoken to me at a deeper level of consciousness than any other post-war American poet. Having written extensively elsewhere on Hayden in terms of race and poetry, I want to focus on his grappling with the universal evils and violence that human beings perpetrate on one another. In words, in words in the morning time, evoking Vietnam, poem three offers a striking example. He comes to my table in his hungry wounds and his hunger, the flamed out eyes, their sockets dripping, the nightmare mouth. He snatches food from my plate, raw fingers bleeding seizes my glass and drinks, leaving flesh fragments on its rim. 
Horror incarnate, Vietnamese napalm. The horrifying dehumanization of the image evokes and condemns what we Americans have become, merciless in our military might, imposing our will on others, our political and military industrial congressional complex, destroying anything and anyone that stands in our way, carpet bombing nations into submission, ignoring, in the case of Vietnam, the UN resolution that we not go into that country. Only Randall Gerald's The Death of the Ball Turret Gunner spoke to me the way that many poems by Hayden did. No solipsistic postmodernism in Robert Hayden. I remember once his reading to me and laughing about a poem by Stanley Plum, like recounting uh, walking across the street to visit his grandmother. Is that all? Roaring. No patience for the self, the small world of the self, detached aestheticism, or what Salt Bellow scathingly called knee jerk nihilism. Indifference to life in this world in which we have to live. Hayden's poetry is not the cliché poetry of witness, nor the accounts in the daily newspaper, but a profound meditation and exploration of the dehumanization and moral and spiritual vacuum that produce violence against other human beings. A pair of human eyes behind the mask of Coke bottle glasses peers out at the horror, seeking, demanding it mean something, that the toll of all the horror be taken account, felt, felt by the reader with a human intimacy deep in the heart, deep in the soul, artfully suggesting raw head and bloody bones night, no more. Deathly, Hayden's sensibility and craft carries the reader toward a higher stage of humanity, consciously opposing Auden's stricture. Hayden believed, quote, poetry does make something happen, for it changes sensibility. In such poems, Hayden taught and showed me the way to write about my own experience of modernity in my first book of poems, Into the Ruins. Robert Hayden is one of the great American poets. When I think of the major modern poets, Yeats, Eliot, Auden, Mihosh, I'm compelled to recognize their comparative breadth and the fact that each also wielded a prose pen with which they studied the tradition and plumbed its depths. Robert Hayden's prose is of a different nature, most of it composed of interviews. Taking, talking with him once, he explained it to me by saying, I've never really had any ideas about all that, end quote. I was shocked to hear him say that because I knew he had real, read widely in poetry and literature and taught various classes for decades. Yet his gift resides elsewhere in poetry of remarkable language and imagination, clarity of vision, Insight. I have always agreed with what Lawrence Goldstein wrote in the Detroit Free Press, Free Press on April 20, 1980. The bridge of the past here, Quote, Hayden ranked among the greatest of contemporary poets of any color, end quote. I still don't believe there's another American poet, poet of his generation that achieved a body of poetry comparable in exquisite language feeling, compassion, love, and universality of humane vision. His development over the decades was arduous and hard won, but his achievements shall last as long as people care about American literature and poetry. 33 years after his death, Robert Hayden's poems have already demonstrated that they will be among those few to go forward into the centuries. Our presence here today indicates as much. In his interview in, in the Baha'i Magazine World Order during the U.S. Bicentennial, Hayden states, quote, Americans have always been dissenters, have never submitted long to injustice. Alluding to Emerson, Thoreau, and the Quakers, 
quote, there have always been among us people who have some vision of how things ought to be, and they have led the rest of us, the rest of the country, in the right direction. Unabashedly, unapologetically, Hayden has something he wants to communicate to the reader. Often, after meditations on horror, something he wants to tell us. Once, under a high window in Angel Hall, sunlight streaming in, and in the very room in which Hayden said he had sat in W. H. Auden's class, the analysis of poetry, I sat and heard him say it. Peering out towards the, gla the class, a book in one hand, mildly, quietly even, he tossed it out, the other hand grappling in the air, quote, poetry has to have something to do with the transcendent, end quote. That is the ancient criterion of the highest art for every civilization on this planet. Without any argument or follow-up, moving on to another topic, that was it. In his TV interview with Ron Scott, he stated it in the universal terms of the mystic. Quote, there is something beyond and behind all that we do. I knew there and then in Angel Hall and had never forgotten it, that I had heard words that were rarely spoken during the age of criticism, doctrinally tending to celebrate Nietzsche, Freud, Marx, similar minds and thinkers, dehumanizing theories and sophistry, sophistries. Listening carefully to Robert Hayden, he states in his interview with Dennis Gendron, Referring to world order and to a poem he was working on, sections will have to be left out for the magazine. Some things I don't want to appear there. Adding, quote, if I had not become a Baha'i, we have to attack this indirectly, I might have become a humanist. Talking about studying Baha'i in 1941, he says in the collected prose, quote, my wife went to study groups more often than I did. And she still does, for that matter. <laughs> Alluding broadly to authoritarian leaders and behind the veil of art, to Baha'i counselors who impose very tight control over freedom of speech and conscience, and authoritarianism that comes out of the Iranian Shiism within the height of Baha'i faith. This poem, American Journal, refers to, quote, the counselors to whom the persona must report about his mission to earth. The counselors would never permit such barbarous confusion. They know what's best for our serenity. Why should we sanction old hypocrisies, thus dissenters? The counselors would silence them. A decadent people, the counselors believe, I do not find them decadent, a reputation not permitted me. At times, Hayden and even Mrs. Hayden would mention counselors. They felt very worried about for good reasons as time has proven. Hayden was not a Baha'i fundamentalist and loathed literal-minded interpretations of the Baha'i writings and delighted in criticizing and caricaturing Baha'is. In the night blooming series, the persona unobtrusively slips in that the newly opened flower is, quote, a lunar presence or doomed, already dying, which is to say belongs elsewhere than in this world, already passing. Trust the poem, not the poet. Again, Gendron. Hayden reveals there is part of him that is convinced that there is transcendence, that there is a spiritual dimension and there is God, and at the same time, there is the other side of, uh, side of me that finds it very hard to accept that, that finds it very hard to believe. He allows that he can't, quote, completely surrender and be absolutely obedient. In more candid terms with me, alone in his study, he would quietly get up and close the door and then say, quote, it has always been important to Herman 
that I remain a Baha'i, end quote. Repeatedly on other occasions, emphatically, quote, why I continue to have anything to do with the Baha'i faith, I do not know, I do not know, end quote. After he died, I continued to pack up his papers and eventually delivered them to an archive of Mrs. Hayden's choosing. I remember sitting alone in his tiny study thinking of T.S. Eliot's line, leaving disordered papers in a dusty room. The room was no longer the same without him. And I recall Irma, perhaps in the role of loving wife, meaning well, telling me he had never been beaten as a child, though unbeknownst to her, he himself had told me that he had. Similarly, as a caring wife will do, she always claimed much more involvement on his part of Baha'i faith than in Nashville and elsewhere than he himself did. He once said, alluding to these matters, and we call the problem, quote, I suppose everything will have to come out someday. I reply, the world always deserves the truth. There can be no growth otherwise. 33 years after the man's death, I don't believe personal obligation demands anything be hidden or swept under the rug. Quite the reverse. Everything is in the poems and the prose. To a significant degree, the world has caught up with race and Robert Hayden. His sexual battles just aren't the problem that they used to be for a man of his generation. Ultimately, his religious consciousness is in the broadest sense affirming the humane, the universal, the potentially divine, and the human creature, adding, quote, I've always been a believer of sorts, despite periods of doubt and questioning. I've always had God consciousness, as I call it, if not religion. End quote. His experience runs deeper and longer if, again, we listen carefully. For instance, with Ron Scott, he lightly slips in that he was very much involved with the Second Baptist Church when young. Quote, much more than many think or realize, end quote. And was for a time training to be a missionary to Africa, which is <laughs> always a joke for him. Uh, there too, him, and uh, personally. Uh, self-deprecatingly kind of sense of humor. One of his life insurance policy, policies that I had occasion to see was with that Baptist Church. His first book, Heart Shape in the Dust, also record, records Hayden had a sense of the spiritual even then, evolving further too with that theme over the years. Hayden's spiritual life did not begin with his conversion to the Baha'i faith in 1943. Nor did his becoming a Baha'i solve all of his personal problems. In 1975, Hayden told Gendron he felt blocked by something. I would argue it was partly his better judgment that something was amiss with the Baha'i faith, which doesn't sufficiently surface until the advent of the internet in the mid-1990s. In another sense, Hayden finally confronts with Watson and the tattooed man written during the fall of 1979, accepting himself, achieving an integration of being and healing that he had long sought. To be clear, I am not saying that Robert Hayden is not Baha'i, but, but that what he believed was the Baha'i faith can now be seen as not entirely existing, as reminiscent of W.B. Yeats' myth in his book, A Vision. Hayden learned this, too, from Yeats, a myth. A myth that Hayden did not have to entirely write for himself. Hayden's universal myth was a turn to seeking grace and mercy symbolically in many poems. As I wrote in my 1983 essay in World Order, recentering the turning of the tide in Robert Hayden, I still believe he's the first American poet to realize there's a way out of the enemy of modernity through universality and a profound change of sensibility, not ultimately narrowly defined as an exclusive Baha'i box. 
heroically maintain that there is no such thing as white poetry or black poetry, just American poetry. The same can be said for the high poetry. Hayden's poetry is much more sophisticated and nuanced, questioning the nature of reality and whether and how we can know it, to what extent such knowledge is even possible. Robert Hayden speaks on many levels about transcendence and his Baha'i faith. I cannot speak for a dead man, but I can say that I believe that the man I knew would never tolerate much of what has transpired in the religion since his death, recounted in my book, Letters from the American Desert. Robert Hayden must not be allowed to be co-opted in any position that remotely suggests he would have approved of injustice and fanaticism, as, been, as has been done implicitly on his Wikipedia page, controlled by Baha'is for over a decade. Robert Hayden's poetry is too vital to American literature to be enlisted anachronistically in the proselytizing and support of an organization that has increasingly become antithetical to much of what Hayden tells us is most important to him. Justice and human dignity, freedom and liberty of conscience, democratic principles, and the transcendence that he found in the universal divine. In the end, we have Hayden's impeccable art, as in his Yeatsian meditation on Whistler's The Peacock Room, where Hayden artfully writes, briefly, I shelter. What is art? What is life? What the peacock grew? Rose leaves and ashes drift its portals, gently spinning toward a bronze bodhisattva's ancient smile. Parliament of Poets, Apollo calls all the poets of the nations, ancient and modern, east and west, to assemble on the moon to consult on the meaning of modernity. On earth and on the moon, the po poets teach a new global, universal vision of life. In a three-minute excerpt from a 12-minute canto, the persona begins to recount how he traveled with there with his guide, the poet Robert Hayden. While I was trying to absorb it all, a figure emerged far down the hill where I could see two trees close together, dressed in a jacket and vest, a decorous bow tie near the pond, incongruous, out of his habit, holding a tall black spear with a broad wide blade tapering to a point. Walking towards me, I noticed he adjusted his bow tie with one hand peering through bottle-thick glasses. Egads, I exclaimed, Bob, is that you? Remembering the day by chance. Walking across the campus diag, I had seen that figure in front of Angel Hall. Recognizing me, too, he smiled back. Two poets, one now grown older, both lessened by time. We laughed, looked at one another, shaking hands, embraced. Stepping back, I said, Ah, that spear is just so not you. And he, grabbing and fanning his lapel as was his want, I'll have you recall I was the young poet who aspired to fulfill Stephen Benet's prophecy of an American black poet with a spear chanting a song for his people. And I still honor that, though complex for some. Laughing together, I shot back, They still don't get you. You're human. Forget that crowdy scowl. And you, my friend, have done what you told me, taking my breath away, gasping as I recall. Oh, yes, I remember. I've been so many, for so many years. Even as your words, my God, you're going to have such a difficult time, have proven all too true with every passing year. What a young fool I was to think all I had to do was serve Robert Frost 20 years. <laughs> Laughing on the patio, he said, many poets make that mistake. Enough of that, too. Waving his hand, sweeping it all away, a gesture that only he could make. 
I will name their names and they shall come, come for us, carry us heavenward to the moon. I have come to lay my black spear down by Roland's horn. Do you think they'll be able to get back? Howlingly funny would be roared. The old understanding passing between us, my friend and mentor, I still his apprentice. I hazarded that cliches are even thicker now than you were catching myself. He just smiled and said, shaking his spear in the air, boy, step aside and let a real poet show you how to get to the moon. What a sight we were there in the meadow. And um, 